A crackdown on crime or an act of provocation? Kosovo's police have detained several people, including two UN officials, in its Serb-dominated north. Serbia has now deployed troops along the border. So what's caused this new flare-up between the two neighbours with a history of religious and ethnic tensions? This is Inside Story. Hello everyone, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. Welcome to Inside Story. Problems between Serbia and Kosovo. They go back, well, 10 years to Kosovo's independence. They go back to the war of the late 1990s. They arguably go well beyond that as well. So when tensions flare up again as they are right now, there is some cause for concern. On Tuesday, Serbia put its troops on full alert after armed Kosovan police entered the Serb-dominated area of northern Kosovo, fired tear gas, and, according to some reports, live ammunition, and arrested 23 people. Kosovo called it an operation against organized crime and corruption. The arrests even included two members of the UN mission in Kosovo. Serbia's president, Aleksandar Vucic, says he wants to preserve peace and stability, but that Serbia, quote, will be fully ready to protect our people at the shortest notice. Before we move on, just a quick reminder of how these countries came into being and why there is still this tension. Here's the map. Kosovo, an autonomous region in the former Yugoslavia uh, until its breakup in the 1990s. Following that, separatist pressure from Kosovo only increased. Of course, led to Serbia's crackdown on Kosovo's Albanian population that was only ended by a NATO military intervention in 1999. Kosovo declared its independence in 2008. It has since been recognized by more than 100 countries, but, crucially, Serbia and Russia still see it as part of Serbia. These latest incidents signal rising tensions in northern Kosovo, parts of which remain largely outside the control of the government in Pristina and instead pledge their allegiance to Belgrade. So here's Natasha Butner now reporting from Mitrovica, where Kosovan Serbs protested against Tuesday's police raids in the area. Well, we are in North Mitrovica. This is a predominantly Serb municipality in the northern Kosovo. But people here don't feel aligned to Pristina. They feel very close and aligned uh, to Belgrade and Serbia. And they've come here to protest because they say that they are being intimidated by Kosovan authorities. Now, this is because on Tuesday, Kosovan police launched a major operation. They say it was across the country, but particularly in this region, against uh, smuggling of all sorts of goods such as uh, uh, petrol and cigarettes. They made uh, several arrests, among them um, some Serbs and Serb police officers who will later appear in court in Pristina. Now, uh, Serbian people here say this is just an opportunity to try and frighten them, to try and intimidate them. The president of Serbia has put troops on the border on full alert. He says this is for peace and security, but also that they will be able to respond if needed. The president of Kosovo says that this is simple law enforcement, but the whole situation has also been fueled by Russia calling this a provocation as well because of course Russia is an ally of Belgrade, an ally of Serbia, Serbia and Russia who do not recognize Kosovan independence. All right, here's the panel for today to discuss things. We're starting in Belgrade with Dusan Janic, a former Serb politician, now head of the Forum for Ethnic Relations. In London, Svete Koneska, Associate Director of the consultancy group Control Risks, uh, with a focus on Central and Southeastern Europe. And finally, in Berlin, is Bodo Weber, Senior Associate of the Democratization Policy Council and a specialist on Kosovo-Serbia relations. I thank all of you for joining us today. I want to start, and I'm asking a lot here, I know, but I want us to look at this latest incident in isolation outside of the history between the two countries. I know there is so much history, but still, let's look at this incident. I'll start with you, Dushan. Kosovo has said it is about corruption. It is about organized crime. It is about smuggling. It is about drugs. Are those actually real concerns in this part of the world? You know, it's, uh, we have uh, on the spot uh, really two narratives. About one thing, you will have immediately two interpretations. No doubt that the, from Kosovo point of view, and the point of view of international presence in Kosovo, that was one of the actions in the larger activities fighting against the organized crime 
and especially in the whole territory, including the north of Kosovo. Mm. Uh, the motives for that are, of course, visa liberalization for Kosovo and also to show who is controlling territory. Basically, the question which arised in the last one year is who, is, who has the sovereignty of the, the north mm. of Kosovo? From point of view of Serbs and Serbia, that's the only fight for the control of territory. Uh, people are doubting that uh, really Kosovo want to uh, fight against the organized crime, including in the situation in which they are really de facto, they are arresting the people who are the part of organized crime. Mm. For, course, for the Serbs and Serbia, is the most important issue is the stat status of Kosovo and the territorial mm. integrity of Serbia, meaning control of the north of Kosovo, or be clear, the human needs and the human beings are not on the first level of the politics in Serbia and in Pristina. OK, and we're going to come back to that issue of territory a lot more, I know. Sveta Koneska, let me bring you into the conversation uh, from London. Your thoughts on what the actual Kosovo and police are supposedly cracking down against? I mean, drugs is one problem. I know previously there was, I think it was in the year 2000, something like 40% of the heroin in uh, Europe and North America came from Kosovo. So there have been problems with things like drugs and, and smuggling in the past. Is it still enough of a problem now? Thank you, Kemal. Without doubt, organized crime is a major issue in the region, especially, as you mentioned, in um, Kosovo, Serbia, in the border regions, which are not always well patrolled. We see um, semi-porous borders. So organized crime is or is supposed to be one of the key priorities for governments to tackle in the region. So with that in mind, and looking again, as you said, in isolation, uh, this incident, uh, this event, um, there is no reason to doubt the motives of the Kosovar government that they were looking to tackle organized crime networks uh, in their country, that it followed similar operations elsewhere in the country earlier on this month, also adds to the evidence that they were looking to, to dismantle a big uh, organized crime network. Now, having said that, um, there are issues about how the whole operation was conducted. Um, as you mentioned earlier, there are concerns among the local population about the use of excessive force, there was tear gas used, there are allegations about firearms being used. So all of these issues put some question marks as to how the whole operation was conducted and what other messages were being signaled there um, yesterday when the Special Forces members um, went to North Kosovo. Mm. And, but and by so, and large, sorry, let me, let me jump in there, um, I think I'm we can bring... all agree that organized crime... OK, uh, yeah, organized crime is an issue. So, Bodo Weber, let me ask you that. Uh, uh, Svet has, has, has raised the point that there is a problem there. It does need to be dealt with. But the way that the Kosovan government and police went about it, it seems to be extremely heavy-handed. And certainly that's what the Serbs would say. Kamal, um, I would agree with my predecessors. There is a, a serious a problem with the weakness of the rule of law and with high-level organized crime and corruption in the whole of the region, especially but not only in Serbia and Kosovo. Uh, and given that fact, you know, and the fact that uh, the judiciary and the police are not independent in these two countries, um, any action against organized crime is always uh, part of a kind of selective justice, you know. Uh, so this on a general ground always, you know, raises um, suspicion about the very action as much as, as normally inaction on organized crime and corruption. Now, we have the very specific case over the north of Kosovo where basically the, the unresolved status dispute of Belgrade's action, Serbia's action for 30 uh, years, uh, insisting that Kosovo is part of Serbia has mm. uh, uh, drawn the region more and more away from Serbia and uh, left uh, the region, and especially the north and the limbo, where you have a specific, because of this status dispute, um, the rhetoric of uh, the, that they are part of Serbia versus the reality being somewhere in the twilight zone, where it has been created a very extreme specific a nexus of organized crime and, and, and a political patronage system. So 
um, whenever you know uh, but Pristina is acting in that context, uh, which also ha has a link between uh, Albanian and, 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 mm. and Kosovo Serb one and Serbian one, it raises suspicion. And especially, you know, as this is, I think, the second or the third of such action, which really looks like a film plot over the last 12 months, which is mm. clearly, you know, linked with the overall uh, very uh, um, um, high-level negotiations on a final comprehensive agreement between yes. Kosovo and Serbia that unfortunately have gone in a completely wrong direction and raised uh, tensions among the two countries. Mm. And again, we will come back to that issue a little bit later on and issues to do with EU uh, ascension. What do we make, though, and maybe I'll come back to you, uh, uh, Dushan, in Belgrade, what do you make of the way the Serbians have reacted here? President Vucic has put his troops on high alert, and that sounds dramatic, and I'm sure it looks dramatic as well. Do you think he would actually act, or is there actually too much at stake here for both countries? I mean, just added one point on what was previous said. Sure. Don't forget that in our case, Serbia, Kosovo, uh, the organised crimes, uh, players, politicians and guerrilla fighters are on the power. Mm. They are really closely and strongly connected, meaning the, all the leaders of the organized crime groups, they are some kind of the instruments in the political games. When Serbian not the direct control, what is the situation in reality, sometimes is using the channels or for communication with Albanians, like in the situation of the taxes and the boycott of the uh, custom goods mm -hmm. trade, or sometimes for provocation of different uh, security incidents. Go back to your question. I think that uh, uh, Vucic's reaction mm. was uh, some kind of the, how to say, uh, a poker game. Mm. He tried to arise the level of uh, crisis to show clearly to foreigners, as you use that sentence, and to Albanians, mm. that Serbia is ready to fight or to protect the Serbs. From the other side is the message for local population in Belgrade, that there are the limits of that intervention. Uh, to be clear, uh, I, I am sure that his idea was, was not to send the army, but the idea was to show the readiness and to prepare, if it's needed, some other instruments for provoking the local uh, armies and other conflicts. Because if you uh, listen, uh, ser uh, ser seriously listen to his speech in the parliament, he said that there are basically for him two options. One is the dialogue with some compensation in territory, a normalization for plus territorial compensation, or the long term, five or ten years, crisis. Mm. I think that now we are on the crossroad to go in the deep crisis and deepening, risking the localized organ, uh, armed fights or to go to dialogue. We will see in Paris what will happen. Well, when you talk about dialogue, and I'll, I'll address this to all of you and then and we'll get separate answers, but there has been dialogue. There had been EU-brokered talks which were going on. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Serbia walked away from them uh, in November. And again, it came down to the issue of territory, as you've all uh, talked about. And then there's the fact that both want to ascend to the EU at some stage. I go back to my point that there is a lot at stake here. And maybe I'll ask you about this, uh, Tsvete, the amount that is at stake which might actually hold them back from that crossroads which Dushan just described and take them down the path of talking rather than the path of fighting. Absolutely, and I agree with you there, Kemal. I think this time round there is much more at stake for both sides. And I do not expect to see that uh, the violence in Kosovo or across the border will escalate as a result. Um, both countries, both governments have had as their priority to improve relations with the European Union for a very long time. That's a key foreign policy priority for both states. So 
taking acts that are going to jeopardize this goal, it's not going to be helpful either domestically for their voters or externally with the European Union. So I think this should prove sufficient to persuade um, or to kind of weigh in on the, on the side of renewing the talks, which have been stalled since November, but finding a compromise and walking away from flexing muscles and showing strength and force such as, you know, Vucic's statements uh, for the army being on full alert or on the Kosovar side, we've seen imposition of, of tariffs and um, other measures which have antagonized Serbia and, and led it to walk away from the, from the talks. Lord Weber, is it enough, in your opinion, to keep them from going... Uh, down a path that no one wants them to go down. I know we talk a lot about the history between the two countries and, and uh, well, what could set that off again, but from what I've heard from all three of you, this is more about a, a current issue now, about territory, rather than the historical uh, conflict. Well, I would say no. This is not even about territory. Mm. Uh, this is about uh, the West and the EU uh, trying to be, having started to be a serious actor in one part of the world, southeastern part of Europe, in 2012-13, you know, starting the so-called political dialogue through some leadership by the German Chancellor, Great Britain and the US, bringing an end to the status dispute. And they, they went to, to almost a historical uh, turn, you know, by linking Serbia's EU aspiration with uh, demanding from them to recognize the reality that, that Belgrade knows for a very long time that they have lost Kosovo and, you know, moving towards recognizing that reality which has taken place in 2013 with the so-called April Agreement and on focusing, you know, on, on organizing and safeguarding normal life for Kosovo Serbs, integrating them into the Kosovo state, which, including in the north, has started in 2013. Unfortunately, what we have seen over the last two years in the so-called uh, final stage or new stage of the dialogue, final negotiations on a final comprehensive agreement mm. uh, on comprehensive and overall a normalization of relations is an unholy alliance, you know, um, within the context of the crisis of the EU and the West since 2016. Mm. Uh, we've seen uh, the Serbian president trying to, you know, exploit that to get some gains and to, uh, depart from the original agreement, trying to get some territory out of Kosovo, uh, Kosovo President Thaci has, has uh, um, reined into that position of land swap uh, because he has basically privatized uh, the whole dialogue in Kosovo mm -hmm. and, and alienated the whole rest of the political lead for, you know, uh, uh, escaping from some war crimes indictment. And we have seen, uh, unfortunately, the, the high representative of the EU dropping basic principles of the EU's and West's policy in the Balkans, that is, never go into ethno-territorialization because this was the start of the Balkan Wars, yeah. um, for, for some, you know, reasons of getting any deal done uh, before the end of her mandate. Unfortunately, supported by the Washington, uh, by Washington, Mr. Bolton and the Trump administration uh, from their position of, you know, any deal is a good deal. That yeah. has raised enormous tension in the region. This, uh, this know, attempt of land swap has hit a wall, you know, with the Berlin summit in, in April 2000, in, in April this year, April 29. And it seems like, you know, that certain provocations we saw now, like, like yesterday, hmm. could, you know, be, uh, have to deal something with organized crime, but they could also easily be an attempt, you know, of the two presidents in Belgrade and Pristina that have hmm. hit a wall with their policy of two years to, to create facts on the ground. That is something we have seen last year with similar arrests. Uh, so this is always, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, an area where we have to guess, you know, whether this is really about fighting organized crime or whether this is really about provoking a crisis. Mm. So Bodo's done a great job there of, of widening things out for us, talking about Washington, talking about the EU, talking about the West. Dushan, can I add Russia into it as well? A big international player these days, a supporter of Serbia. Is it watching this closely? Do we need to watch Russia closely in this story? Uh, surely, it's from my point of view experience. Uh, we are now witnessing on the new stage of Kosovo crisis, a basically unfinished war or unfinished job from the 90s. All time, Russia was involved in some ways. During the 90s and until the Putin era, Russia was collaborating with the West and helping to, in some way, to managing the wars in Bosnia and Kosovo. Now is the completely different situation. Uh, first of all, we, we could not hear the one voice 
from Washington, Brussels, so-called West, mm. including NATO. We have a lot of voices, a, a lot of interest. The Russia is using the, that situation, threatening its proper uh, presence and influence. First of all, through politics, civic society, through co communication with the religions, uh, co uh, churches, plus what is most important, energy, security. Mm -hmm. Russia is the one of the main supplier with the gas of Serbia, and also is the owner of the biggest energy company in Serbia. The influence of Russia is everywhere in culture and politics are really strong. But it's not one-sided. Russia has also the influence not so strong on the Albanian side, sometimes directly from Albania, sometimes via uh, Ankara uh, and Erdogan. Yeah. But going back to the today's situation, uh, we could see something what you recognize as the influence of Russian methodology of managing conflicts. Uh, the Russian, so-called Russian, but is one of the how to say most successful products, is producing the ethnic conflicts and management with that, but the territorialized uh, that ethnic conflicts. Uh, if you are looking what is the main uh, dispute between the West and Russia, mm. there's the NATO, the spreading of the NATO of, over the Europe. And I'm sure that Russia is using this crisis for stopping uh, the spreading of the NATO over Serbia, Macedonia, Kosovo, and Bosnia. Mm. Maybe that the fight for uh, Montenegro is uh, over, but using the crisis from the north, you are destabilizing Montenegro, meaning the NATO. It's really high level player. Mm. In the same time, Russia has some political strategical interest to negotiate with the Brussels and Washington about Ukraine and Georgia. And the Western Balkan and Serbia is one uh, really, I would say, functioning card in the hand of Russia and Moscow in that negotiation. So, Sveta, you mentioned earlier that you didn't think things were going to escalate further. But at the crux of it all is some sort of rapprochement, some sort of agreement between Kosovo and Serbia. How likely is that, actually, when there is so much animosity between the two over, over territory and over so many issues? One thing I can say is that there's a, definitely a momentum in the region now to address long-standing disputes. And here I'd like to mention how... Greece and Macedonia resolved earlier this year, last year, uh, their dispute over the name of the country, North Macedonia now. So there is some pressure on both sides to find some compromise, an agreement, a mutual agreement, and solve this long-standing problem between the two countries, which should unblock uh, <clears throat> problems with integration into the EU or if the government's desire, so NATO, which in Serbia case I think is unlikely, but mm. Kosovo might want to do it. So um, as long as there is mutual agreement uh, and as long as there is um, a leadership within both countries and both governments, I think some rapprochement solution is possible mm -hmm. and is definitely desirable. Now, having said that, there will be spoilers on both sides domestically. There may be external actors, Russia or other uh, regional powers, who will not necessarily welcome a resolution of a problem of this nature. But um, it is difficult to forecast exactly when the right yeah. set of circumstances will arise uh, to see this solution. Boro, well, I've got a few seconds left. Can I get a final thought from you, right. please, if you don't mind, just on the idea of this, as we say, normalization of relations? Right, Kamal, this is not about uh, centuries old grievances or, or, or a, a strong Russia. This is about a weak West. We've seen uh, over the last 12 months in this push for land swap a perfect alliance between the presidents of Serbia and Kosovo. So this has nothing to do with grievances. This has to do with the fact that um, some of the actors in the West, based on the current chaos within the West, both in the EU and the US side, um, have departed from the original framework of the dialogue that have shown be to be successful. It started with uh, declaring the status dispute closed, Kosovo to be an independent state, and Belgrade basically signing up to this. So this reopening of the status issue has more to do with the West than with Belgrade and, and Pristina. So, mm -hmm. Uh, what I think we have now is, and I'm very hopeful, uh, hopefully the, the Berlin summit by Mr. Macron and President Macron and 
Prime Minister Merkel at the end of April was the beginning of a complete reset of the dialogue, return of the dialogue to its original framework, and that will ultimately lead to some form of recognition of what the Belgrade knows is there, the independent Kosovo in return for an EU membership perspective mm. and the integration of Kosovo Serb with full corrective rights. And only on that basis, you know, Kamal, mm -hmm. can there be a basis for a real fight against organized crime and corruption. And this has to start with dismantling the nexus between organized crime, right. um, the Serbian list, which is the one party system in the north um, and Pristina. Bordo Weber in Berlin, along with Sveta Koneska in London and Dusan Janic in Belgrade. Thank you so much for joining us for Inside Story. And thank you for watching as well. Do head online to aljazeera.com. You can see this program again anytime or any of our other episodes there. Uh, you can get social too. We're at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. We're on Twitter at AJ Inside Story. And I'm at Kamal AJE if you want to tweet me directly. So thanks so much for joining us for Inside Story. See you again soon.